Hello, everybody. <clears throat> we'll get started here in, in a few minutes. Hey, Sandy. Susan? All right, we're gonna go ahead and uh, get started tonight. Um, tonight we're gonna be starting a new series through First and Second Samuel. Uh, tonight's gonna be mainly uh, an introduction to the both books, uh, and then next week we'll start with uh, I think chapters one, two, and three. Um, make sure of that before I say it. Yeah, one, two, and three. So if, uh, for next week, if you want to read that, that would be good to, to prepare for what we're going to go over. But tonight we're going to introduce the two books. Um, originally in the Hebrew Bible, they would have been one book together. Uh, and so that later they were separated into first and second Samuel. It would have just been one book uh, before. Uh, first and second Samuel are some of our most beloved, contain some of our most beloved stories. Uh, you think of Samuel, the little boy, um, asleep, and God calling out to him, and him going to Eli and, and saying, you called for me. It's a great little VBS story. Uh, you've got David and Goliath. Uh, you've got uh, David and Bathsheba. Uh, you've got the, so, many, so many great stories that kind of just, uh, even a lot of people who don't know uh, the Bible as a whole can remember some of some of these stories, uh, and and so they're some of our most beloved. But it's also when you think about First and Second Samuel, and you were say, okay, well, what what are we reading when we read First and, and Second Samuel? What kind of um, did I lose it? Oops, this says it's live. I don't know if y'all can still see me and maybe experience some trouble on my end. Okay. 
Well, then I'm just going to keep going. Uh, I'm going to keep watching the comments. Um, if for some reason the video goes out, just uh, let me know. And uh, I'll be watching the comments over here. Uh, but for some reason, it's showing up strange on my end. All right. I'm going to keep going. So First and Second Samuel uh, contains some of our most beloved stories. But most of the time when people ask, okay, what genre are we looking at when we uh, are reading First and Second Samuel? What, what type of book is it? And most people would respond, it's history. Uh, but it's not like the history that, you know, you go crack open a book in U.S. history or world history. It's, it's, it's different. And the reason it's different is not because it's not writing about history, but it's history that's trying to communicate a certain point. Uh, it's, in other words, um, it's not just going around with a video camera and showing us what, uh, what, what just happened, but it's also trying to explain something. Is trying to explain and talk about God's relationship with his people. And, and so in a sense, it's preached history. Uh, it's history that's told, but with a certain uh, idea. It's, it's history that's told to communicate a certain thing about God and his people, whether it's about who God is, what he's done, uh, his promises and things uh, like that. Uh, and, and it's meant to communicate something to people. And so uh, it, it wasn't just written to record what happened. Yes, it's important. We, we need history books to tell us the things uh, that happened in the past. But when we come to First and Second Samuel, it's not just telling us about what happened in the past. It's trying to communicate certain truths about God and his people and specifically lessons that we're supposed to learn from those kinds of things. Uh, when we read First and Second Samuel, I, I, I linked an article in the comments. I hope you'll go and take a look at it. Um, a preacher by the name of, of Wes McAdams did a, a, a series of blog posts where he read through every book of the Bible uh, and just kind of talked about some things that, that you that you notice, uh, that he noticed when he, he read through it. So I've linked that. I would encourage you to go look at it as you think about First and Second Samuel as a whole, uh, because it really is a, a book about contrasts. At the very beginning, you have Eli and Samuel, uh, and how they contrast with one another. You've got Hannah and Peninnah. Uh, Hannah, the, the beloved wife, and Peninnah, the one uh, who had the children, but still didn't have the love that she desired from her husband. Uh, you ultimately have the contrast between Saul and David, and you have so many different contrasts that happen throughout uh, the book, and, and that's one of the things that, that Wes points out, and so I would encourage you to, to go take a look at that. But as we read through First and Second Samuel, you'll notice uh, different ways of, of reading it because it, it communicates on so many different levels. On the one hand, it does communicate on an individual level. When I come to First and Second Samuel, I can ask the question, what does this mean for me? How can I learn from it? There will be lessons that we can learn from uh, these books. But then it also communicates things on a national level. First and Second Samuel tell the story of going from the judges, the period of the judges, to the establishment of the monarchy, to the kings, to Saul, David, and Solomon, and all those who, who come after him. It records the promise to David that he would never lack a man to sit on the throne. It talks about God establishing his house, establishing his name in a place that he talked about back in Deuteronomy. It contains so many things that are important to Israel as a nation, but it doesn't just stop there, but it, you go and you connect this to the way it's been going to the promises of God back to the very beginning. And we'll look at a few of those. And so the books of First and Second Samuel, yes, it's important because they do communicate truths that we, you and I can learn from. But when we look and try to understand this book in the context of what it's trying to say, it meant a lot to Israel. It meant a lot uh, to what God had promised and how he was faithful to those promises to this specific people that he had chosen to be with and through whom he was going to bless the world. Uh, and we see the promises that he makes to David, and we'll, we'll even look at some of that a little bit further uh, tonight. But then we also get to see that this book fits into the grand scheme of what God is trying to do uh, in his world, going all the way back to Abraham and saying that he was going to bless all nations through his seed, 
that he would make his name great. Uh, and, and so this has a very universal scope all the way down to the individual things. We can see the promises of God uh, being upheld. We can also learn from those that came before us. And we also get to see how God is faithful to his people and how he is a God that we can trust. Uh, at the beginning of the book, we are moving from this period of the judges to this period of having a king. Uh, if you remember the book of Judges, one of the things that, you know, uh, I had to learn a song when I was little, and so I can actually name the judges of Israel. I don't uh, attribute that to any brain power other than that I was required to memorize a song when I was in a Bible class growing up. But if you remember the judges, one of the things that really sticks out from that time is a phrase that's often repeated is, uh, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And in those days, Israel had no king. Uh, and those kind of two things go together very often. Uh, as you see this cycle, it typically happens with Israel where uh, they disobey, they get caught up in a dispute with their neighbors, whether it's the Philistines or the Moabites or all these different people that are around them. And God raises up a judge who is typically a military leader, someone who's going to deliver them uh, from the enemy. And, and so God raises up this judge. He leads the people to victory, brings them out uh, of whatever trouble they are in, and then they go about their lives. And this cycle keeps repeating over and over and over and over again. And you finally come to Eli, who's not only a judge, but a priest. And uh, we see that people are still doing what's right in their own eyes. Because even though Eli is the priest, even though he's the one who's supposed to be the spiritual shepherd of his people, telling them about God and leading them in the ways that it means to follow God, we see that his own sons don't follow in the footsteps of their father. Everyone is still doing what is right in their own eyes. And so we, we, we know that uh, Yahweh, God, is supposed to be the king of his people. If you go back and we're studying on Exodus on Sunday mornings, uh, and specifically Exodus 20 through 24, when we start giving these laws and, and the people start getting these laws, it, it resembles what would happen in the ancient world when a king would make a treaty with his people, where he's offering some protections, he's offering them a way that they have to live. And so if you look at Exodus 20 through 24, another place is Joshua 24, or even the entire book of Deuteronomy is kind of based on this idea that God is the king. He has saved them with his powerful right arm. He's brought them and redeemed them out of Egypt. They're his special people, his prized possession, and now he's telling them how he wants them to live while he is the king and they are his people. Another place that this shows up is in the Psalms. Uh, there are many Psalms that ascribe kingship to God, but one in particular uh, is Psalm 47. I wanted to, to read that tonight. Psalm 47. Hey, Anne, just saw you popped in. It says, Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy, for the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared. A great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under his feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our king. Sing praises, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God, and he is highly exalted. Uh, as I said, the period of the judges, one of the refrains that keeps happening, uh, especially uh, in the latter part of the book, is in those days there was no king. Now, it's making an observation that there wasn't a king to unite the people. And one of the, the when finally... Uh, Samuel gets to that point in his life where they're looking down at his sons who are also not following in their father's footsteps. And the people of Israel come to him and they say, basically, your sons are worthless and you're getting old. What are we going to do? We want a king. Well, just like in the period of the judges before this, this was a day in which there was no king. But the way it's observing is not just that there was no king to sit on the throne, but the people were treating God as if he was not their king. 
There wasn't a king sitting on the literal throne, but there also was not a king ruling over them, the king that was supposed to be their king, the Lord. Uh, God was supposed to function as their king. He was the one who was supposed to fight their battles for them. He was the one who had redeemed them. He was their savior. He was their defender. He was their shield. But they forgot that he was the king. And so they asked for a different king to be like the other nations because everyone wanted to do what was right in their own eyes rather than in the eyes of the Lord. And so God is supposed to be the king Going back through the book of Judges, we see that he's not. Everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes, uh, something that's plagued humanity from the garden until even now. Everyone wants to be their own God. They want to rebel against any authority over their life, and they want to seat themselves on the throne. And so now they're asking for a king, not to rule over them and that they could follow, but so that they could be like all the other nations because they were doing what was right in their own eyes instead of seeing God in the way that we're supposed to see him. So that's one of the main things that kind of goes throughout this book as we go through 1st and 2nd Samuel. 1st Samuel uh, is mainly, even though it bears the title 1st Samuel, it's mainly about Saul, King Saul. Uh, the first few chapters of Samuel are about kind of bringing Samuel to prominence, showing uh, his faithfulness to God, showing his place in bringing about uh, the kingdoms, the monarchy that's about to follow. But 1st Samuel is mainly about Saul coming to power uh, his very quick uh, success, but then his rapid decline because of his disobedience uh, and his unfaithfulness to God. Uh, because he was doing what was right in his own eyes instead of in the eyes of the Lord, he ended up losing this. And so David's quickly introduced as well into the book, uh, but he doesn't really gain prominence in the sense of his own kingship until later in 2 Samuel. So where 1 Samuel is more about Saul, 2 Samuel is more about King David. When we think about this, this, these books as a whole, one of the things that really rises to the surface is this idea of Messiah. Uh, and that's the word that, that we hear. That's the word that uh, is, is so prominent with us. And if you were to say, who is the Messiah? Most people would say, well, it's Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah. We see that question being asked uh, of Jesus during his lifetime. Uh, and, but when we break that word down, what Messiah truly is, is just the anointed one, the one whom God has chosen to anoint, to work through. And so Saul was an anointed one. David was the Messiah, the anointed one. Uh, but these are pointing through to something, uh, way more Im important later. Um, when we come to the problem in first Samuel, we, we see the failed leadership that's taken place. Uh, that the judges, even though they were deliverers, oftentimes they weren't people you w would want to emulate. You see Eli and you see the, the, the kids that followed after him. Uh, and we, you go and you read about some of the judges and they weren't all the best people. So you have failed leadership who are not modeling what it means to follow after God and judge the people appropriately. You have a failed people because there's still uh, idolatry. Uh, as we'll look at in a second, very quickly, um, the, the Ark is taken away because they think they can use it as some totem, as some token uh, that guarantees God's presence in his victory. And ultimately, they have a failed faith because it's not in the Lord, but it's in themselves and what they think God is going to do for them. And this is how things are when people do what is right in their own eyes. You have failed leadership, you have a failed people, and ultimately, you have a failed faith. Now, uh, Oftentimes it gets mistaken, I think, uh, to think that the problem that the people have is that they ask for a king in the first place. Uh, that some people just, well, they, should, they shouldn't have asked for a king in the first place. Well, it seems even from some of the earlier books that God envisioned a time when his people would have a king. If you go back all the way back to Genesis, so we'll flip over there for a second. Uh, Genesis chapter 49 So Genesis uh, 49, and this is a chapter talking about Jacob and his sons. So Jacob has the, the 12 sons, the 12 tribes. Uh, and when he's approaching the end of his life, he gives them a blessing in, in Genesis 49. 
And when he comes to Judah, I'm going to start in verse 8, but he, he's blessing Judah, his son. This is what he says to Judah. Judah, your brother shall praise you, and your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down and crouched. He crouched as a lion, and as a lion is who dares rout him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So even from the beginning, there's this sense uh, where we're kind of tucked into this promise of, of the tribe of Judah is the, the scepter's not going to depart from it. There's going to be a sense in which there's a ruler that comes from the tribe of Judah. And you even see that allusion to a lion. You may have heard about the lion of Judah. We sing about that in some of our songs. But there's a sense in which royalty is going to come from that particular line. But that's not the only place that we see it. Uh, in Deuteronomy as a whole, and so we'll flip over to Deuteronomy, specifically chapter 17. Deuteronomy 17. So this is all before Israel even gets into the land. Uh, Genesis has taken place a long time ago. Jacob, when he's blessing his sons, it happens before, uh, before they get out of Egypt, before they're, they're going into the land. And Deuteronomy is happening before they get into the land. And so in Deuteronomy 17, 14, it says, When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as a king over you, and you may not put a foreigner of you, which is not your brother. It goes on to list several things. But even in Deuteronomy, there's a sense in which it anticipates that there's going to be a king. The question is, is who is the king going to be, and what type of king is he going to be? The people are asking for a king specifically so that they can be like the other nations, but they were not called to be like the other nations. They were called to be that city on a hill. They were called to be God's special possession, and the ruler, the king that was supposed to serve the people was someone who was first and foremost faithful to God, who upheld justice and righteousness in the land and caused all people to follow after Yahweh. And so God is supposed to be the king uh, who is in following. And so we see that the people raise up Saul. He's the one who stands out. He's the one who looks the part. Uh, and very quickly, we see that always what we think is going to be successful, what we think is right in our own eyes, is often not what God has intended. And so the one who is right in the eyes of the people is a failure, whereas the one who is after the heart of God is the one who God chooses to establish the kingdom forever. Uh, if you go over to Ezekiel, we're going to flip around a little bit, so I hope you got your fingers in your Bible. Uh, but David, uh, since Saul, the kingdom failed with Saul, when you come to David, he's the one whom God makes the promise with, and kind of as they, as they move on through history and they look back over what the ideal king is supposed to be, it's supposed to be someone who is uh, like David. So when you come to Ezekiel chapter 34, which is specifically against the shepherds of, uh, of Israel, those who were supposed to uh, lead the people, and you come to verse 23, it says, And I will, in looking to the future of, of someone that he's going to set up over his people, it says, I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. So even later when you get to the prophets, and Ezekiel is written to those who are in exile, it's looking forward to uh, the true fulfillment of this king that David was supposed to be. Because even though David was the man after God's own heart, he had his failures too. Uh, and it's one of those times in scripture where you're almost uh, convicted a little bit because even though D David is the one who's the man after God's own heart, he has his failings. But he was always one to repent. He was always one to, to turn back to God. Isaiah. Ooh. Pages are sticking together and I'm not turning to the right place. All right, so Isaiah 11. 
is also looking forward to this time. And Isaiah 11, 1 says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. When you come to the New Testament, as it's looking to this promise of David, especially looking as this king who's going to be like David, someone who's a son of David, you see that Matthew takes great pains to show that he comes from David. You go to, to Romans, the beginning of Romans, and it makes the statement that um, in the first few verses where Paul is starting out this and says, concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power. Uh, the New Testament stretches in, in the Gospels, but as well as in the letters, that Jesus was the Son of David, that he descended and was connected to that promise that God gives to David uh, in, in 2 Samuel chapter uh, 7. But not only that, as, as we think about what even more what David, how important David is as a king, one of the promises uh, that God gave to the people in Deuteronomy was that eventually when they came into the land that they would have rest from everybody around them, that they would no longer be at war and they would be at rest and God would cause his name to dwell in a certain place. And that's where we see Jerusalem really come into prominence. We see the ark come in and that's in fulfillment of what uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12 talks about. And so we see this theme, this theme of kingship being important and the people are asking for a king, but what they're failing to realize is by asking for a king, they're denying God his true role as king. And so when God puts a king on the throne, he's not doing it for what they're asking for, but what he is calling a king to be, someone who is righteous and just and follows after him. And quickly, what happens with God putting a king is you see the, the rise of the prophet uh, in, in Israel. Uh, that Samuel is a prophet, and you'll have Nathan and Gad and even some unnamed prophets th throughout the book. Because when the king comes to power, you have to have the word of God that could come and speak to that power. And so pr a prophet is literally the mouthpiece of God who brings that word uh, to the king to remind him of, of his role, to remind him of what he's supposed to do, uh, to give the king advice. And so you see that when kingship comes up, you see the prophets, the, the, the office of the prophet really come into importance uh, as, as, as well. And so we'll look at several prophets that come up uh, throughout the book of, of Samuel. And so we've seen uh, the covenants, we've seen the, this theme of king, uh, the rise of the prophetic word, which will come, we'll look, especially look at Samuel uh, as, as a prophet. But also one of the things that really crops up in, in the book of First and Second Samuel is the seri seriousness of sin, but also of repentance. Uh, we see that in these books that there are consequences for sin. Uh, many times, even uh, for those who are faithful, we see that the man after God's own heart, uh, when he makes choices to, to commit sin, it has ramifications not only for him, for the people, and for all those that even affecting generations down the line. And so one of the things that really jumps out to us is that disobedience really does have consequences. It's not something that can just be swept under the rug. Uh, and that leads to kind of another important thing, which is the importance of repentance, this idea of turning to God and not just, you know, I'm going to turn and, and ask for forgiveness and get back to going, but it's truly a turning to God in the sense I'm turning my life uh, to him. I'm going to read a one passage because I think it's important to, to highlight this point. Um, but when we come after, uh, so not next week when we do 1 Samuel 1 through 3, but when we get to 4, uh, you see that the, Is the Israelites are going to go to battle with the Philistines and they bring the ark out and it gets captured. Uh, but then what happens is, uh, is Samuel calls on the people to repent. And so in, in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3, he says, And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. We see that repentance is not just something that, it's not just something that comes out of our mouth, but it's truly a turning our lives. It's, it's an action. 
It's not just a statement we make. It's not just asking for forgiveness. It's not just saying, I'm sorry, but it's, it's accompanied by action, the putting away of something and the taking on of something else, something more important. So we see Samuel calling the people to repentance here. And then we'll see, uh, we'll, we'll get to it later, but Saul is kind of the contrast to that. The person who doesn't want the consequences of his sin and so asks Samuel what he do and will say that he's sorry. But the reason he's sorry is not because of the sin that he's committed, but because of what the people think, because of the consequences there. And then you have David, who's this other portrait of repentance, that even though he commits great sin, in fact, when you look at the lives of Saul and David, and you were to ask which one was the man after God's own heart, by just putting their uh, either their accomplishments or even just their, their, their downfalls and say, which one is the man after God's own heart? You might be tempted to say, well, neither. Neither one's a man after God's own heart. But part of the reason that David is the man after God's own heart is because when he's confronted with the truth, he truly repents. So you go to places like Psalm 51, where we read the words, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. This is someone who feels the depth of his sin, who truly understands that he's wronged God and wants to make amends. And so we see this portrait of sin and repentance really come to the fore. Like I said, this is preached history. We come to First and Second Samuel's, and it's um, it's it's a book that does contain the history of Israel, but it's not dry. It's meant to challenge our lives. It's to remind us of the faithfulness of God, that He's being true not only to His promises to David, but all the way back to Abraham, and saying that I'm going to bless people through your name, and I'm going to make your name great. And we see that the name that ultimately God truly makes great, as we read about in Philippians chapter 2, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue uh, confess. That's the name that God has elevated, the true Messiah, the one who is the king, the one who sits on the throne. And so as we, we see First and Second Samuel, we always have to look to what God is doing because it's not just reminding us of what God did, but that his promises are fulfilled ultimately in Jesus, that he's the true Messiah. He's the one who is king, the one who came to execute justice and righteousness perfectly. But even the one who, as the good shepherd, was willing to lay down his life for the sheep. The one who deals with the seriousness of sin and calls his people to repentance. It's going to be a, a good study, and I look forward to getting into it with you. Uh, for those who may not have heard me earlier, I just want you to know that I posted a link uh, in, in the comments section to, a, to an article that somebody else wrote, kind of a little introduction uh, to First and Second Samuel. I'd encourage you to go to read it. I would encourage you to read chapters 1, 2, and 3 for next week as we dive into the, the birth of Samuel and kind of looking ahead is, is his promise and his, his, uh, his importance in this story. Hope you'll have a good night, and I look forward to, to being with you uh, next time.